In the summer of 1942, these two tiny islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, west of Hawaii, were at the heart of an epic battle. Fought between the navies of Japan and the United States, it was a battle that decisively altered the course of the Second World War. Japan was intent on using its navy to expand its power in the Pacific, and it had an ambitious plan to destroy the main obstacle standing in its way, the Navy of the United States of America. The battle they fought marked the coming of age of a new type of warfare at sea. It was a duel to the death in which aircraft carriers and their warplanes played the pivotal role. I'll be revealing how victory or defeat hung on the snap decisions of American and Japanese commanders. And I'll be exploring the tactics they used as they unleashed these new weapons of war. The decisions made by the pilots and crews on both sides were also critical. I'll be revealing the terrifying risks they took as they fought and died out there in the vast reaches of the Pacific Ocean. And I'll be experiencing some of the horrific conditions they endured in the heat of battle. This titanic struggle was decided in five minutes of unimaginable destruction. Five minutes that turned the balance of power in the Pacific upside down and transformed the rules of war at sea. It was the Battle of Midway. The events that led to the Battle of Midway started here in 1941. The island of Oahu, part of Hawaii, today America's 50th state and one of the world's most exotic holiday destinations. Back in the 1940s, US servicemen counted themselves lucky if they were posted here. Early December 1941, with only 15 shopping days left till Christmas, the people of Oahu were taking it easy. After all, the United States was at peace, not yet actively involved in the Second World War. But the world as the Americans knew it was about to change beyond all recognition. Just 300 miles to the northwest of Oahu, a fleet of warships was bearing silently down on this island. America was about to be propelled into World War II. Heading unseen for the Hawaiian island of Oahu was the combined fleet of the Imperial Japanese Navy. This armada had departed from Japan in absolute secrecy and crossed 4,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean under total radio silence. They did not plan on being detected. This battle fleet was the most powerful naval force ever to put to sea. It had been sent to attack the United States by the hardline military government of Japan. The Japanese were set on building an empire in Asia and the Pacific and were willing to use force to do it. By late 1941, Japan here was already in control of Korea and was engaged in a long war for control of China. It also set its sights on the European colonies of French Indochina, British Malaya, and the Dutch East Indies, roughly present-day Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. The Europeans were absorbed in a war against Germany. So the only thing standing between the Japanese and their vision of empire was the United States Navy. And in particular, America's main naval base in the center of the Pacific on the Hawaiian island of Oahu.
The name of the base? Pearl Harbor. This is Pearl Harbor, one of the finest natural harbors in the world. Here it is on the map on the south side of the island of Oahu, a narrow channel from the Pacific Ocean opening up into a huge sheltered anchorage. The harbor was the perfect haven for America's Pacific fleet. By December 1941, it was busier than ever, with nearly 100 ships at anchor, eight of them battleships moored up on Battleship Row, all of them engaged in the relaxed routines of a peacetime navy. But that peace was beginning to show signs of strain. The Americans were wary of Japanese expansion and tensions were beginning to mount. In a show of strength, they had transferred more of their warships from the west coast of America out here to Pearl Harbor to be 2,000 miles closer to Japan. And it was the massing U.S. Pacific Navy that the advancing Japanese strike force was intent on destroying. The approaching Japanese fleet included battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. But at the heart of this armada were six enormous aircraft carriers, floating airstrips packed with over 400 fighter, torpedo, and bomber aircraft. The world was about to witness the most spectacular example yet of a new form of warfare at sea. Japan may have been a country steeped in tradition, but when it came to naval warfare, it was one of the most advanced nations in the world. And the man at the forefront of all this was the commander-in-chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy, Admiral Izaruku Yamamoto. Yamamoto was a great visionary and modernizer. He was a pioneer of naval aviation and had been quick to grasp the potential of aircraft carriers, the latest weapon in the naval arsenal. Yamamoto could now use warplanes on these carriers to strike at targets hundreds of miles away from his fleet. By 1941, Japan had around three times more carriers in the Central Pacific than the Americans. Yamamoto had created a formidable carrier force capable of pursuing Japan's imperial ambitions. And by Sunday, the 7th of December, 1941, six of his aircraft carriers were in position ready to mount a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese were battle-hardened veterans. They'd been fighting to extend their Asian empire for years. The men on the aircraft carriers were at the peak of their skills. Each of these Japanese aircraft carriers were crewed by up to 2,000 highly trained servicemen. Their job was to support squadrons of elite pilots who'd spent years in combat missions flying bomber and fighter aircraft. These naval aviators were among the best in the world. They'd never been defeated, and in the early hours of the 7th of December, they were only two hours flying time away from Pearl Harbor. Every significant American installation on the island of Oahu would come under attack. The Japanese strike force would make a landfall on the island's northern tip, Kahuku Point. Here it is on the map case. Yamamoto planned to send in over 350 warplanes from his carriers in two ways. The first would veer off west, hugging the ground to achieve maximum surprise. The second wave would swing round from the east. Yamamoto's aircraft would go for the major air bases dotted round the island to annihilate America's planes on the ground before they could take off. But this was his prime target. Pearl Harbor. 
where the pride of America's Pacific fleet was tightly clustered, utterly unsuspecting what was about to come. On board the carriers, the pilots put on fresh uniforms and their traditional headbands. They had a ceremonial meal of rice and said their last prayers at the shrines on board. Minutes later, they were off. The crews of the ships lining the deck, waving and cheering. We listened to the radio. The American stations were broadcasting normally, so it seemed they were not aware of anything. And then I knew that it was going to be a sneak attack. The attack on Pearl Harbor was scheduled for 8 a.m. Here at Pearl Harbor that Sunday morning, the main event on many sailors' minds was the flag-raising ceremony. It was the same every time. At 7.55 a.m., ships' companies gathered, and five minutes later, the flags would be raised right across the fleet. On board the USS Nevada, tied up here with the other battleships on Battleship Row, a band was gathering on the deck, preparing to play the national anthem. It was now just moments before 8 a.m. the USS Nevada, the bandsmen, still halfway through the national anthem, were horrified to see a Japanese plane release a torpedo at a nearby battleship, then peel off, strafing their ship, splintering the deck and shredding the flag. Under fire themselves, the bandsmen finished the national anthem and then dived for cover. Airfields, barracks, and all of America's great battleships came under attack. Just after 8 a.m., a bomb smashed into the USS Arizona, igniting the ammunition store. Down below decks, over 1,000 men lost their lives. The devastation was just unbelievable on those battleships. You think they're big, heavy, a lot of heavy steel and all that. When you see those superstructures just twisted, big hunks of steel that were twisted just like you take a straw and twist the thing. I couldn't believe the amount of devastation that I saw. America had lost the best part of its Pacific fleet. The Japanese had sunk 21 ships, like this one, the Utah. All eight of the big battleships were out of action. Hundreds of planes had been destroyed, and nearly 2,400 servicemen and civilians had been killed. By attacking Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had made a declaration of war without parallel. The next day, the American president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, addressed the nation. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. America was down, but not out. In the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, a new man was put in charge of what was left of America's Pacific fleet, Admiral Chester Nimitz. He was sent here to Pearl Harbor by the president himself. His orders, not to return home, 
until Japan was defeated. Nimitz was an experienced commander who proved his ability to instill confidence in his men. But he had an enormous task. Morale had plummeted, hundreds of planes had been obliterated, and all the battleships of the Pacific fleet were out of action. But Nimitz held one ace card. By chance, every one of the aircraft carriers in America's Pacific fleet had been out of port at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. They were now all that survived the main striking force America had in the Pacific. These carriers and their aircraft would now take on the Japanese. In spring 1942, the Americans began their comeback with a daring raid using their aircraft carriers. On board, a handful of US pilots led by Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle were taken deep into Japanese waters. This Doolittle raid involved 16 of these bulky B-25 bombers. They weighed more than 12 tons each. They really weren't designed to take off from aircraft carriers. But for this mission, the bombers were transported on board the USS Hornet within about 700 miles of the Japanese coast. Then at 8 a.m. on April the 18th, carrying as little weight as they could, they moved off along the runway, just managed to take off and headed towards the Japanese capital. For hours, Doolittle and his men flew low over the ocean to avoid the patrolling Japanese planes. Then, when they got to Tokyo, they dropped their bombs. America and her aircraft carriers were beginning to fight back. And just over two weeks later, having attacked the Japanese mainland, the US Navy took on the Japanese Navy at sea. On May the 7th, the American aircraft carriers made their presence felt again when they engaged with Japanese carriers in the Coral Sea, just northeast of Australia. The battle saw the first ever attacks by carrier-based planes on their opponents' carriers, and both sides were hit hard. the Americans managed to sink a small Japanese carrier. But the Japanese destroyed one American carrier and left the other, the USS Yorktown, in flames out at sea. The Japanese had left the USS Yorktown ablaze in the water. They thought that they'd sunk her, or at the very least crippled her and put her out of action. But what they didn't realize was that there had been a ferocious struggle to save the Yorktown. With one carrier now destroyed and only a few others operational, every carrier the Americans had left was vital. They had to save the Yorktown. For crews like the Yorktowns, hundreds of miles away from land, knowing how to tackle fire was essential if they were to save their ship. I went to a naval training center to experience for myself some of the challenges faced by the Yorktown's crew as they struggled to extinguish the flames. Can I put your hat on? Yep. And uh, we'll go up onto the unit. OK, so this is a replica of a ship. OK, we're now in the engine room, and this is where you're going to be doing the, most of your firefighting. OK, you're going to make your entry down this vertical ladder. Okay. However, before you come down here, you're going to have to put the fire out on top. The fire that you're going to be fighting today is going to be this engine fire here. 
it's just all like warped and melted and cracked from the heat. That's not making me feel too confident about it. No, this. I mean, it shows just how hot this fire is going yeah. to get. And you're going to be the first one down here and you're going to be providing the protection for the rest of the team. It's important that you get, get it right because the rest of the team are relying on you to get into position to protect them from the rest of the fire as they make their way down there. So it's a real team job. It is definitely a team job. OK, I'm going to do the straps up. OK, pair of gloves. I'm lucky. I'll be using much more advanced kit than that used by the Yorktown's crew at the Coral Sea. But it's still a daunting task. I'll have the key role of spraying a wall of water to protect my teammates from the flames. We'd all been briefed in advance, so I knew to take up my position next to the door. But I still didn't really know what I was in for. Wow, that's hot! Those flames are enormous! OK, I'm going in! there would be an intense fire below me in the engine room. With the metal walls heating up all around us, we'd literally be descending into an oven. The men on the Yorktown would have faced a similar challenge as they battled to save their ship. I'm just going down the ladder. I'm just going to take it slowly because it's very, very slippery because we've thrown so much water and foam down here. It's incredibly hot. I'm at the bottom of the ladder now. I've just got to set the hose up like this in a, in a, in a wall, a shield of water. The pressure on this hose is, is huge. You can just see these explosions, these fireballs are coming. Oh, I can almost reach out and touch them. But this shield of water that I'm putting up, this wall of water, is so effective that the fireballs aren't actually getting through it. But it, it's pretty intimidating being this close to fire. The thought of doing this for real on a carrier like the Yorktown, loaded with aviation fuel and ammunition, was terrifying. I can really understand what I'm doing here now, and the rest of the team is going to try and get to the base to fire and put it out. How did you find that? Incredible. Was that hot? It certainly feels warm. <laughs> okay, just hang on a minute. That's it, well done. Just get your hood down. Oh. Okay, you all right? Yeah. Well, you managed it. You achieved the aim. Ooh, it's pretty hot in there in that last room. Yeah? You feel pretty self-sufficient in there. If you don't put the fire out, no one else is going to. And I guess on board a ship, that's an incredibly powerful feeling. You're on your own. You could, be, you could be 150 miles from land. You're on your own. It's your team. They've got to get down there. They've got to put that fire out. Things were no different in the Battle of the Coral Sea back in 1942. Although she had been severely damaged, the desperate work of the crew had saved the Yorktown. In the coming weeks, this would prove to be a crucial victory the Yorktown would return to haunt the Japanese. But in the meantime, she began the long, slow journey back to Pearl Harbor for repairs. The Battle of the Coral Sea was a wake-up call for Admiral Yamamoto, Commander-in-Chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy. America's remaining carriers stood between him and mastery of the Pacific. It was time for drastic action. America's carriers had to be destroyed. 
They had eluded Yamamoto at Pearl Harbor. He would not let them escape again. He decided to lay a trap. He would target something so valuable to the Americans that they would send out their carriers to protect it. And the bait for his trap would be Midway. Midway is, in fact, two tiny islands west of Hawaii, halfway between America and Japan. It was one of the few American air bases left in the Pacific. Yamamoto's plan was complex, and it involved the greatest naval fleet the world had ever seen. The main part of the fleet was divided into three groups. Yamamoto himself would be in a group centered around three big gun battleships. To the south, another group of ships carrying thousands of soldiers who would land on Midway and take control. But here was the spearhead of the attack. A group of four aircraft carriers and their escort ships, the Carrier Strike Force. The 248 aircraft of these carriers were given two critical tasks. First, they would bomb the defenses on Midway ahead of the planned landing. Then they would stage a huge airstrike on the American carriers when they came to Midway's rescue. Leading the carrier strike force would be Vice Admiral Chuchi Nagumo on his flagship, the Akagi, the carrier from which he had commanded the attack on Pearl Harbor. Nagumo was a highly professional naval officer with over 30 years' service. The Japanese high command was confident that Nagumo would once more lead the Imperial Japanese Navy to victory. But his carefully laid plans underestimated Admiral Nimitz, the American commander. After Pearl Harbor, the Americans had made military intelligence a top priority, and it had paid off. The Japanese naval code had been cracked. Here, at their intelligence headquarters in Pearl Harbor, the US Navy deciphered details of Yamamoto's plan to set a trap at Midway. With this information, Nimitz now planned an ambush of his own. Nimitz now had three operational carriers in Pearl Harbor. The carriers USS Enterprise and USS Hornet departed first. Then the newly repaired USS Yorktown followed on a little way behind. The three carriers headed from Hawaii for a spot codenamed Point Luck, 300 miles northeast of the American base on Midway. By the 2nd of June, they were in position and lying in wait for the Japanese ships that were approaching from the northwest. Nimitz had given his commanders a single bold objective, to ambush the approaching Japanese fleet now heading for Midway and strike a decisive blow at its carriers. But these weren't the only preparations that Nimitz was making. Out in the middle of the Pacific, the US base at Midway was buzzing with activity. Preparations were underway. Flight after flight of planes had been landing over the last few days. And now the small airfield was packed with as many planes as it could handle. These planes would be vital in the defense of the island. So would the US Marines, who would be waiting for the Japanese if they tried to land. By June the 3rd, the pilots were waiting by their planes, the Marines in their bunkers. Nimitz had now done all he could. His ships were in position, his commanders briefed, and the garrison on Midway on full alert. But Nimitz knew he was about to be confronted with more aircraft carriers, more battleships and more destroyers than he had. He even knew roughly that they were coming from the Northwest. The question was, where exactly were they all? 
for days, American aircraft have been sent out from Midway across the vast stretch of the Pacific Ocean, searching for the Japanese fleet. By the early hours of June 4th, 1942, researchers were already hotting up. The code breakers have discovered that the Japanese planned to attack on the 4th, but there was still no sign of their fleet. The Pacific Ocean covers a quarter of the Earth's surface. For the Americans in their, their big and slow flying boats, fighting the Japanese fleet in just a small sector of this vast expanse was an enormous task. In fact, the four Japanese carriers had got within range of Midway without being spotted, and they had already launched their strike force. Finally, at 5.40 that morning, an American scout plane spotted the huge formation of Japanese bombers and fighters heading towards Midway. The American pilot sent back an urgent warning. It was not a moment too soon. The Japanese planes were aiming to destroy the parked American aircraft on the ground. The Battle of Midway was about to begin. Within minutes, nearly every one of the American planes on Midway was taking off. The Americans were desperate not to be caught on the ground, as they had been at Pearl Hub. A mixed batch of over 40 torpedo planes and bombers was dispatched without fighter escort to strike the distant Japanese fleet. And 25 fighters were sent up to intercept the formidable array of Japanese fighters and bombers that would soon arrive to attack Midway. The American fighter pilots were in for a rough ride. Many of them had only just finished flight school and didn't have that many hours of flying under their belts. To make matters worse, even the best American fighter aircraft, this one, the Wildcat, was totally outmaneuvered by the Japanese fighter, the Zero. The Zero could outrun and outclimb anything the Americans could put in the sky against them. These Zeros were going to be a real threat to the 25 American fighters sent to intercept them. Suddenly, Wildcats appeared and dashed through our formation. Our Zero fighters saw this, and in a five-minute dogfight, all the Wildcats were chased away. The American fighters did manage to shoot down a couple of enemy bombers, but for the most part, they didn't stand a chance against the Japanese in their Zeros. After all, the Japanese pilots were among the most experienced and best trained naval aviators in the world. After only a few minutes, nearly every single American fighter that had taken off from Midway had been shot down into the ocean. At 6.34 a.m., the Japanese arrived over Midway and began attacking the airfield. The Americans fought back bravely, but their island base was shattered. Despite the destruction they'd inflicted, the Japanese realized that their real targets were missing. The American bombers weren't there. Within minutes, the news that the American bombers had not been destroyed on the ground by the attack on Midway reached Vice Admiral Nagumo on his flagship, the carrier Akagi. But he didn't have long to wait to find out where they'd gone. They were now directly above his carrier fleet and beginning their attack. As the American bombers dived into action, 
they were pounced on by Japanese Zeros. Many of the Americans were shot down. The rest turned back for Midway. Not one of their bombs or torpedoes had hit its mark. Nagumo's fleet had escaped this time, but he knew the surviving American bombers were still a threat. They could refuel on Midway and return to attack him. He had to destroy them when they landed on the island. On his carriers, Nagumo still had reserve aircraft. The trouble was they had the wrong weapons. They were armed with anti-ship weapons in case the US Navy showed up. But Nagumo was still unaware there were any American ships around, so he felt safe replacing these anti-ship weapons with land bombs to attack Midway. Below decks in the aircraft storage hangars of the Japanese carriers, new orders rang out. The crews quickly set to work removing the anti-ship weapons on the reserve planes and replacing them with bombs for a ground attack on Midway. While his men worked furiously on the hangar decks below, Nagumo, on the bridge, was suddenly confronted with a real crisis. He received another message, this time from one of his scout planes. It had spotted what appeared to be 10 American ships northeast of Midway. The news came as a stunning shock. Nagumo had been sure there would be no American ships in the area. It was now blindingly obvious that things were not going as the Japanese had planned. Nagumo immediately suspended the planned second strike on Midway. He now had to deal with the threat from the American ships. He ordered his men to reattach the anti-ship weapons onto the reserve planes. And he sent a message straight back to his scout plane demanding more information. If the American ships were carriers, Nagumo could be in real trouble. The American ships were, of course, carriers. And earlier that morning, they had found the Japanese fleet. On board the American ships, preparations were gathering pace. The carriers Hornet and Enterprise were readying to launch their aircraft. In command of these two ships was Rear Admiral Raymond Spruance, and now he had a critical decision to make. Spruance's carriers were located about 200 miles away from Midway, here on the map case. Yorktown was a little way off on its own. US scout planes had reported the Japanese carriers about 155 miles away from Spruance's position. The Japanese ships were within striking distance of some of his aircraft, but others could barely carry enough fuel to get there and back. There'd be little leeway for them to maneuver, even less for navigational errors. And if they ran out of fuel, the only place to go would be into the empty wastes of the Pacific. But Spruance decided that the critical issue was time. He had to hit the Japanese fleet before they discovered and annihilated his ships. He couldn't waste time moving his carriers any closer to the enemy to give his planes a better chance. So, in one of the greatest naval gambles in history, Spruance ordered all his aircraft into the air in one massed attack. On board the American carriers, pilots made their final preparations. Many were nervous, especially on the Hornet. The Hornet's torpedo squadron had never gone into battle. Many of them had never taken off from a carrier with a torpedo, or a pickle as they called it, slung below them. Some had never even seen it done before.
As they walked out towards their planes, the pilots must have had the words of their squadron leader still ringing in their ears. He had told them, I want each one of us to do his utmost to destroy our enemies. If there's only one plane left to make the final run in, I want that man to go in and get a hit. May God be with us all. Good luck, happy landings, and give them hell. After completing an inspection of the aircraft and its bomb, I climbed into the cockpit, and as I sat there waiting for the signal to start engines, I suddenly got the same feeling of apprehension and butterflies in the stomach that I got before the start of competition in high school. At 7 a.m., the launch began. The pilots of the American Air Armada set off with little battle experience, limited fighter cover, and no margin for error. They were setting out across a vast stretch of ocean in small groups towards a deadly and experienced enemy. If things were looking precarious for the Americans, back on Nagumo's carrier, the Akagi, events were beginning to get out of hand. Nagumo had been desperately waiting for his scout plane to tell him what kind of American ships it had spotted. Now, it gave him its answer. The enemy is accompanied by what appears to be a carrier bringing up the rear. It was a staggering blow to Nagumo. He'd never expected an American carrier to be in the area so soon. Its presence now jeopardized his entire operation. Nagumo knew he had no option. He had to launch a strike at the American carrier. But this realization couldn't have come at a worse time. These are the Japanese carriers here. Just at the moment Nagumo was hearing about the distant American carrier, his midway attack aircraft began to return. They were low on fuel, and they needed to land quickly. Up above them, his fighter planes were also anxious to land. The Gumo now faced a critical decision, which could win or lose him the coming battle. He still had his reserve planes sitting on his carriers, but not all of them were loaded with the anti-ship weapons he now needed to attack the American fleet. He could choose to launch an immediate limited strike with the few reserve planes that were ready before his midway attack aircraft landed. Alternatively, he could delay launching, land the circling midway attack force, and then launch all his reserve planes, which by then would be fully armed with anti-ship weapons. It'd be a big risk. It would take an hour or so, but at the end of it, he'd be able to launch one huge attack, sure to destroy the American fleet. And that is what he decided to do. He would land his midway attack force and wait until all his reserve planes were rearmed so that he could deliver the killer blow. But Nagumo's plan was already going awry. Nagumo had based his decision to postpone launching his planes until they were all ready on information he'd received from his scout plane. His own fleet was here. The report from the scout plane put the American ships here. At this distance, Nagumo knew his carriers were out of reach of the American planes. The problem was Nagumo's scout plane was wrong. The American fleet was actually here, their planes within range. And unknown to Nagumo, American bombers from these ships were already on their way towards him. At 9.20 a.m., the Japanese carriers were spotted by the inexperienced aircrew in the American torpedo bombers. Despite their limited training, they had no choice but to attack. 
The American pilots bravely held their course towards the carriers. They'd hunched low and prayed they'd make it through the storm of anti-aircraft fire coming from the ships. As they roared down towards the Japanese carriers, they were pounced on by a pack of patrolling Zeros. The lumbering American planes were no match for the agile Zeros. 35 of the 41 torpedo bombers were shot down above the Japanese fleet, most of them without even releasing their torpedoes. Those that did, missed. The attack had been a disaster. They'd failed to score a single hit. Nagumo was almost ready to make his move. His deck crews had been working hard to rearm and refuel his planes. If they could be launched quickly, the Japanese would surely win the Battle of Midway. At 10.21 a.m., Nagumo and his men were still not quite ready to launch their planes. At precisely that moment, American dive bombers like this one appeared high above the Japanese carriers, and their bomb run was clear. The Japanese fighters that should have dealt with them had been drawn off to attack the American torpedo planes. There was nothing to stop these dive bombers as they began screaming down towards the decks of the Japanese carriers. A lookout screamed, hell divers. I looked up to see three black enemy planes plummeting toward our ship. Some of our machine guns managed to fire a few frantic bursts at them, but it was too late. There was no stopping the Americans now. Four bombs ripped into the carrier Kaga. And another struck Nagumo's flagship, the Akagi. But even as the dive bombers were attacking the Kaga and Akagi, another group of American planes, these from the Yorktown, arrived from a quite different direction. The Japanese fighters, already overstretched by the first attacks, didn't know which way to turn. Within moments, these fresh American bombers dived on a third Japanese carrier, the Soryu. They slammed three bombs into her. Relatively few bombs had been dropped by the Americans, but their impact was devastating. Three of Japan's great carriers were destroyed. On board the three Japanese carriers, there was chaos. Aircraft, fuel tanks, and ammunition exploded, sending fireballs and huge chunks of metal flying through the air. All three carriers were turned into flaming wrecks, many of their crews suffocating in the smoke, trapped below decks that glowed red hot. A gush of hot air washed over me. We were hit hard. As fire spread, heaps of bombs began to explode with the shattering blasts. I could see, not far off, the Akagi and the Soryu. They too are aflame. It was a terrible scene. The Gumo survived the attack on the Akagi but was forced to abandon his burning flagship. In little more than five minutes, the Americans had struck three times into the heart of the Imperial Japanese Navy at its moment of maximum vulnerability. But all was not lost for the Japanese. The fourth Japanese carrier, the Hiryu, was untouched. And now, 18 dive bombers and six zeros from this one surviving Japanese carrier were sent to search out and destroy the American ships. They were amongst the last remnants of Nagumo's huge force, but these few Japanese pilots were deadly professionals, unlikely to miss their targets.
intent on revenge. The pilots from the Hiryu soon spotted what they were looking for. An enemy carrier. It was the USS Yorktown. The crew of the Yorktown were horrified to see the Japanese bombers approaching. They'd been hit by the Japanese before at the Battle of the Coral Sea, but this time they were prepared. The experience of the Coral Sea had taught them vital lessons in damage control, which they immediately put into action. The five-inch guns opened up first with loud cracks. Then came the rumble of multiple guns. The enemy bombers and fighters were under intense anti-aircraft fire from all the automatic weapons. The sky was black from shell bursts. Red tracers laced the sky. Japanese planes were falling, trailing fire, exploding as they hit the water. Anti-aircraft guns put up an effective barrage which destroyed many of the approaching Japanese planes. But seven of the bombers made it through. They dodged the wall of flak coming from the carrier and dropped their bombs. They scored three direct hits. The bombs ripped through the flight deck and exploded deep in the heart of the ship, snuffing out the boilers. The Yorktown slowed to a halt. It seemed like it was all over for the Yorktown. But the Yorktown's crew were not going to give up that easily. Deep below decks, the engineers struggled to get the ship going again. But the boilers were wrecked. Thick black smoke poured into the intense heat of the engine room, choking the men. For over an hour, they worked against the odds, fixing the boilers. And by about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the Yorktown was operational again, making about 20 knots. Reports from their pilots that an enemy carrier had been destroyed began to revive Japanese hopes. A second attack force was quickly launched from the Hiryu to find and destroy another of the American carriers. <laughs> At 2.40, the Hiryu's second strike force arrived and launched another devastating attack on the Yorktown. The mighty ship had taken all that she could, and soon she was listing to port. Her crew had to abandon ship. The Battle of Midway was now to end with one final act of destruction. The Japanese believed they'd sunk two of the three US carriers. They didn't realize they'd hit the Yorktown twice. They now thought that they were fighting on equal terms with the Americans, with just one surviving carrier each. Based on this misapprehension, the commanders on the Hiryu now made an almost unbelievable decision. For the next 90 minutes, the battle would be put on hold. The surviving Japanese pilots on the Hiryu had been up since before dawn and they were exhausted by the day's constant flight operations. They were barely able to function. So now that it was thought there was only one remaining American aircraft carrier left to sink, the men were told that they had time to take a rest and grab a bite to eat. It was a final, fatal miscalculation. Things were not nearly so relaxed aboard the two American carriers. The American commander, Admiral Spruance, knew that he had to find the one remaining Japanese carrier and strike it before its aircraft could strike back at his ships. And then in mid-afternoon, Spruance got his chance. One of his scout planes 
had located the Hiryu. At 3.30, Spruance launched his dive bombers to finish the job and avenge the Yorktown. 90 minutes later, the dive bombers appeared high above the wooden flight decks of the Hiryu and began their high-speed dives heading towards the middle. In quick succession, four bombs smashed into the Hiryu. They penetrated the flight deck and turned the bridge into an inferno. The last remaining Japanese carrier was on fire. Yamamoto's ambitious midway battle plan had ended in catastrophic failure. With his carriers gone, he'd lost vital air superiority over the Americans. He still had his big gun battleships, but they were little more than white elephants in this new era where aircraft reigns supreme. Yamamoto ordered his ships back to Japan. Just over a dozen American bombs had destroyed the cream of the Imperial Japanese fleet and altered the course of the war in the Pacific. At the Battle of Midway, America lost just over 300 men and one carrier, the Yorktown. Japanese losses were far more severe. Around 250 planes have been destroyed, four carriers have been sunk, and 3,000 men have been killed. Years of combat experience and training had been wiped out. The aircraft carrier reigned supreme, but Japan had just lost the very men it needed to wage this kind of warfare. Japan's naval power never recovered from its defeat at Midway on June the 4th, 1942. America built a whole new fleet of aircraft carriers, but it took three more years of bloodshed before the Japanese surrendered here on the USS Missouri, now moored in Pearl Harbor, where the war had all begun. Japan had been a stubborn enemy and only at last admitted defeat when America delivered the final blow. Atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which launched the world into the nuclear age. Next time, the Battle of Stalingrad. Over 60 years ago, a battle was fought in this Russian city that would be the turning point of the Second World War. It was one of the hardest fought battles of all time. I'll be revealing what it was like for the German and Soviet soldiers who fought street by street and building by building. And I'll be explaining how the leaders' tactics drove their own armies to the brink of destruction. <laughs>